Dick Enberg back here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Dick? I'm fine, Rich. Listen, I, I got my picture, but I'm worried about uh, the context. I want I want to get uh, get my pet giraffe in there, but I, is that going to be too big? For... <laughs> From the San Well, I thought you you donated that giraffe to the San Diego Zoo long ago, Dick, right? <laughs> I did, but it is my favorite uh, African animal. Anyway, hey, this podcast business, I didn't even know what a podcast was. No, come on. And uh, and uh, so I, the invitation was extended, and and uh, I'm really excited. The adrenaline juices are flowing, and we've already done Billie Jean King last week, and Vin Scully uh, tomorrow will be released, and Gary Stevens uh, next week, just prior to the Breeders' Cup. And uh, we uh, did John Calipari in Kentucky. I had to go back there for a speech. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's allowing uh, me once again to be creative and do a little, um, not only the interviews, but I, uh, we call it the sound of success. And so I have an echo at the very end of each uh, show where I do a personal reflection and then a sound advice. I borrow some great quotation that uh, I've collected um, in Gary Stevens' uh, episode it's uh, John Wooden's make each day your masterpiece and uh, just a little nugget that perhaps fans will enjoy it's sound of success the Dick Enberg podcast available on podcast one.com the app or Apple Apple uh, podcasts uh, Dick Enberg joining me here what what please uh, make me a fly on the wall you and Vin Scully because I mean you you go back to the the days broadcasting get together here locally in Los Angeles correct Dick well, and actually, in a way, he was my mentor when I was doing the Angel Games for Gene Autry's radio and TV station in Los Angeles from 1969 through uh, the late 70s. Whenever I drove, uh, my home was in the San Fernando Valley. When I drove down to Anaheim for a game, uh, who accompanied me? Uh, you know, the Dodgers were on the road, and it was usually Vince Scully calling a, a an evening game uh, in the East. And so I was able to listen to the very best all the way to Anaheim. And he is the poet laureate of our profession in 67 uh, years. It's just incredible to think that uh, a man could extend his great career and always uh, w at such a high elite level. Um, and it's uh, in our little uh, podcast chat, and of course it could have gone on for five hours, yes. but uh, unfortunately Vin had other uh, engagements. <laughs> but one of the things I found interesting was that he grew up a do not a Dodger fan, but a Giants fan. Mm -hmm. He would go to the polo grounds and root for his favorite team, and his favorite player was Mel Ott. And so th did you talk broadcasting at all, swap notes of memories? I mean, uh, just give me one more tidbit for uh... – Well, you know, it, it, I was just – you know, you, you're flying the wall. I, that's the way I felt as well, just to be able to hear him, uh, that mellifluous uh, tone of his. And uh, and I did find out a, a little nugget that uh, maybe one of the reasons his voice is so uh, incredibly pleasing to all of us is – he was in the barbershop quartet at Fordham University. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew that he might have gone, gone on and been a great singer? Bar baritone? What was he, Dick? Do we know which one he was? Oh, I'm sure court? a tenor, wouldn't okay. you think? <laughs> Irish tenor? Well, he's got to be. <laughs> Dick Enberg joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. I'm wondering if you could um, give me some advice, if you don't mind, Dick. Um, obviously, you broadcasting uh, for as long as you did, and then you broadcasted uh, – Sports in the late 60s, early 70s, but there were really not many opinion shows or uh, social media with which to share opinions. Uh, that said, um, in this day and age, the conversation of what's going on in society and politics has certainly pierced the bubble of the toy department in the sports world. And I keep getting uh, messages from people, stick to sports, don't talk about it. What was it like for you, uh, late 60s, early 70s, turbulent times being a sportscaster? How did you view your role in all of well, that. I think that uh, our role was really to call the game, report the ball. And in fact, in 1969, when um, Bud Blattner, who was the angel announcer, left to uh, join the Kansas City Royals in their initial year, um, and I prepared in spring training, and I was ready to do my first game nervously at Anaheim Stadium, my first major league game. And Fred Haney was the general manager of the Angels at the time. And uh, he came into the booth about an hour before the start of the game, and he said, I respect this is your office, Enberg. I've been listening to you in the spring. You're going to be fine. Just want to give you one piece of advice, and then I'll leave. The advice is report the ball. And he left, and he never came back to uh, the, the booth the rest of the year. Of course, Haney was a broadcaster himself during the, 
World War II. I listened to him doing Hollywood Stars and L.A. Angels Pacific Coast League games. And it really goes all the way back to Kennesaw Mountain Landis that he didn't want anyone giving opinions. He didn't want you to uh, say during a course, I, I think this will happen or I hope this will happen. I wonder why that didn't happen. And, of course, we've grown tremendously from there. And uh, But I, I uh, without putting my head in the sand, if I, there was a bad play or a bad moment, I was honest about it. But I didn't seek it out. I didn't feel my role was to be investigative. I, I knew a player was out. I saw him in the bar the night before, and he boots a ball. I'm not going to say if he had gotten uh, uh, into uh, his room before 2 in the morning, maybe he would have seen that ball better. I didn't feel that was my role. Um, and I, I think there's a purity about the goodness of the game. And uh, there's so much... Um, interrogation, investigation, so many people trying to dig away at the veneer of the athlete and of the sport and tying it in with the incredible politics of our times that I think it's refreshing when we don't go in that direction. And maybe that's my cop out, but I've always tried to look at the very positive of sports and 95, you know, people say, well, what about the athletes? I said 95% of those that I've met, I wish they were neighbors. They're great. The headlines go to the 5%. Mm -hmm. And um, I just assume they live in another neighborhood. What do you think John Wooden would have thought of what's going on in the NFL with kneeling national anthem and things of that nature? What do you I've, think? I've, do you oh, think, I've thought about that, Rich. And of course, I did their games for nine years. And other than my own father, John Wooden is the greatest man I've ever known. Um, I think he would have allowed uh, his players to make the decision. I, you know, it's hard to. Uh, transfer what he w dealt with Bill Walton during the Vietnam War and Walton going into Westwood and lying down on the street in protest uh, with other students uh, uh, because of the war. Um, and it uh, did indeed have impact, didn't it? And, but on the other hand, uh, Coach Wooden said, you have the right to express yourself in any way you want, but when you put that UCLA uniform on, here are the rules. And, and I respect it. If you don't want to abide by them, we'll find you a couple of nice seats right there at courtside, and <laughs> I hope you'll root for your teammates. Um, uh, today it's so much more complicated, and uh, I, I asked Calipari in, in my podcast interview with him, and he basically he, he circled the wagons on his answer, but the, what I received from it is that he has to respect their feelings, and he has to respect the university and respect uh, uh, our society, and uh, you have to come up with a common common agreement. And I think that's that's the real issue here. It, does it really, I mean, uh, I was listening to the tail end of your uh, past uh, discussion with the, with the gentleman. Is, is all of this accomplishing anything at this point? Are we really, do we have a, the target that we're uh, trying to shoot for and, and to improve upon, or is it just a lot of good publicity? I, I, I hope I hope uh, that it uh, will involve uh, and evolve into something really uh, uh, positive for our, our country. I, it's tough for me. I want to stand and put my hand over my heart. I respect our, our flag. Um, and those who, uh, are they really disrespecting it, or are they just trying to make their statement, and this is the great opportunity on national television or local television uh, to make that uh, accounting of, the, of, of their feelings? A couple more minutes with Dick Enberg, uh, podcaster Dick Enberg, here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. Billy Jean King being your first uh, <clears throat> your first uh, uh, guest, uh, and you saw, I'm sure, uh, in theaters, I don't know if you saw the movie, the movie about Billie Jean King versus Bobby Riggs and the in the Astrodome. Um, I'm wondering if you think that she thinks that what she did on that day still resonates and makes a difference today, Dick. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. She feels that her stand uh, for equality uh, and how it impacted especially uh, the women who who cheered that victory over Bobby Riggs. Uh, many of your uh, audience, your older uh, listeners, have, uh, saw that on national television. Howard Cosell was the broadcaster. <laughs> In a tuxedo, I believe, Dick. I think he wore a tuxedo for the event. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting how they did some movie magic to um, uh, Rosie Casals became the color person at the event only because Billie Jean wouldn't uh, uh, do the uh, – the, the match at all if Jack Kramer, who had stood against women getting the mm. equal rights or equal pay or equal opportunity. Uh, so Rosie Casals was with Howard Cosell, and yet in the movie, the actress Rosie Casals is standing with Howard Cosell, and it's Cosell from the actual telecast. I mean, it's amazing how that what they've done in blending in the actual event, the actual play with the uh, the actresses and the actor uh, 
uh, who both, uh, you know, the, the acting is fantastic. I, I would recommend the movie. And one of the things that I wanted to ask Billie Jean, even before I saw the movie, is why, when she uh, became divorced and became uh, involved with her gay partner, uh, and they handled that uh, sometimes in a steamy manner, um, why didn't she go back to her maiden name? You know, she was Billy Jean Moffat when I first interviewed her after winning Wimbledon in 1966. And uh, and she said, I just, I like the name Billy Jean King. My husband, Larry King, not the uh, talk uh, uh, master uh, Larry King. Yes. Uh, Larry <laughs> King said, why don't you go back and take your maiden name? She said, no, I want to keep King. And it's kind of interesting that their relationship, I think one of the beautiful aspects of the movie is uh, revealing how Larry King, I can't even imagine what would happen to me if I discovered that all of a sudden my wife not only didn't love me, but loved uh, another woman. Uh, and yet he has made maintain a, a close friendship and to this day billy jean king is the godparents of larry king's uh, children with another marriage wow unbelievable dick uh, i i encourage everybody to get sound of success the dick enberg podcast on podcast one i miss your voice on big games dick i'm not gonna lie so i'm glad you're well, podcasting you're very kind, Rich. Yeah, send, me, send me some notes. I could use a few oh. <laughs> uh, added ad libs here on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll do that. I'll do that as soon as I'm off the air. Dick, thanks for calling in. Truly. All right. Oh, my. Thanks. There you go. Dick Ember. The Rich Eisen Show. Weekdays at noon Eastern on radio stations across the country and audience. If you liked some of that, get some more of that on the Rich Eisen Show app. Follow all the information you see right here on The Rich Eisen Show.